on Christmas Eve, the 24th of December, 2017, Juliana Trudos had worked at 10am till 5pm shift at the World's End pub in Camden. After work, she went to meet some friends at the pub. She spent about two hours there and she had a pint and a half of Guinness. Then Juliana went home to pick up some clothes before going back to her friend's house where she'd spend Christmas Day. However, when Juliana didn't turn up at her friend's house, they'd later find out that she never even made it home. Before we get into this case, let's do the disclaimers. This is a true crime case. It's a real story involving real people. So although I don't need to share and comment, please do be sensitive while you do so. Juliana Tudos was 22 years old, and most sources claim that she had Greek and Russian origins. I don't really like how that's worded, but there you go. Either way, she came to the UK from Cyprus in 2013, and by 2017, she had a great group of friends. She was living in Tollington Park, Finsbury Park, London, and she weren't actually living in the park, that's just the name of the area, she was living in a house with a flatmate. As well as many other nicknames, Juliana quite often went by the name of Julie. She'd been described as a bubbly, lively girl enjoying a fun life in London. A very nice person, young and gorgeous, as well as funny, honest, loving, and definitely something special. So, as I just mentioned, she finished work, she went and met some friends, and then she left them friends at about 8pm. She went to go and get some clothes with the intention of coming back and spending Christmas with her friends. And this was all on Christmas Eve. But because she didn't return back to her friends that evening, and because she didn't turn up on Christmas Day either, Juliana was reported missing. Now, I can't be quite sure when her friends and her family first tried to report her as missing, but the police claim that she was reported missing officially on Boxing Day, the 26th of December. And of course, this all rests on her friends, because all of the family live abroad. And while speaking to the police, her friends and her family got the impression that the police weren't all that interested. They mentioned because Juliana was an adult, she was only low risk. But Juliana didn't go missing. It weren't known for her to just wander off or not turn up. So for that reason, she was upgraded to medium risk. But the police also mentioned that 72 hour thing. You know where police are like, oh, you can't report them as missing until 72 hours because they're low risk. And the advice there, by the way, is don't just assume that. Always contact the police. Always hound the police in regards to a missing person. Because as we know in the true crime scene, first hours the first minutes are the most vital and feeling that Juliana's disappearance weren't being taken seriously by the police her friends sprung into action they traveled along the route that she would have took to get home and they were distributing flyers they take them to lampposts as they went past they were posting messages onto social media they contacted pubs and they even phoned around the hospitals Scotland Yard also released a statement a missing persons appeal it stated Juliana is five foot one with a slim build. She was last seen in Camden Road. She was wearing a black and red hooded top with agnostic front on the front, which is American punk band. She was wearing light jeans, black and white van shoes. She was also wearing glasses and carrying a black and white fabric bag with fight against animal testing written on it. And her friends were still getting this feeling nothing was being done. But these friends were still out looking and doing everything they could to try and trace her down. Then at half past four on Wednesday the 27th of December 2017, the day after Boxing Day, two of Juliana's friends were out looking for her and they found her in Finsbury Park. Her body was in a burnt out shed, hut type thing. It was an outbuilding next to a sports pitch. She was inside, laid naked on her back with a jacket on top of her. Her hands and legs were bound with white cable ties. And of course, at this point, despite the police being slow to investigate a disappearance, they were very quick to get to the scene and tape it all off, cording it off. So now was when the investigation really began. And there's a few things you need to know about Finsbury Park. First of all, it's notorious for homeless people. According to locals, at times, especially in the summer, this park is full of people sleeping rough, in tents, under trees. Some even bring furniture from the living rooms, so they've got beds, they've got sofas, and all this other type of stuff. This park is also known to be where men meet up at night to do adult things. Now, this is something that's come up quite a lot recently, and I never knew the UK... I never knew that this happened so much in the UK, but apparently it does happen in this park. And this park had a reputation of not being a very safe place to be, especially at night time. And finally, the park is really close 
to where Juliana lived. Some sources say it was close as 500 yards away. Cutting through this park would have been a shortcut for Juliana to get home after she got off the bus. And further more than that, her friend said that she'd quite often avoided this park during the night. She'd walked the long way around for safety due to the thought of danger of being robbed or even worse in the park at night. However, in recent weeks, she'd started to brave it. She'd apparently taken this through route three or four times. And her friends extended from that, saying it was only half past eight at night, so there will be more people on the street, probably more people in the park. So she'd have felt a little bit safer, even though it's winter, so the park would have been dark. And to me, that resonates quite a lot. It's the beginning of winter, so it's going to have been cold, possibly even raining, I don't know. But she's going to have wanted to take the fastest route home. Especially because she just wants to get there, get her stuff, and get back out. Now, for you that are listening on podcast, you won't be able to see this. But this park's quite a big place. And up in the corner, there's like a baseball field. The sports field that we've already mentioned. And that's separated from the rest of the park by a river. The river is lined by trees. And this hut where Juliana's body was found was by the river, just by the trees, on the baseball field. The police were quick to notice that about 40 metres away from the hut, was a tent by the river. The tent was believed to be used by a few different homeless people and that were also cordoned off separately. Not only was the tent searched and forensically examined, but a purple suitcase from inside the tent was also searched and examined. Divers also searched the river. Forensic officers also marked out what appeared to be clothing on the grass. During their investigation, police found Juliana got off the bus from Camden at Manor House, which is towards the bottom of the park. She was then seen on CCTV heading towards the park at 33 minutes past 8 in the evening. But that were it. The police had no motive, they had no witness, they had no suspects. Although they were very suspicious about this tent and whoever had been in it. They searched Juliana's home, but again, that didn't bring any evidence or suspects or links. Her family and her friends all said that she didn't have any enemies, she didn't have any issues with anybody, there was no reason for anybody to want to harm her. She didn't even have a boyfriend at the time. And of course, this is no longer a missing person investigation, it's a murder investigation. So the police put out a statement appealing for any witnesses or any information to come forward. So let's just take a step back and look at everything so far. Juliana's been found in a place where there's lots of homeless people, it'll have been dark, Obviously, their main suspicion at the minute is that it's a robbery gone wrong. But then, as is often the case, their big breakthrough came when they found out that Yulena's bank card had been used. It had been used with a PIN number just hours after she went missing. Some money had been withdrawn. Now, again, this information differs. Some sources say £30, some say £100. And I also think it might have been used to make an in-store purchase. So, of course, this is a great lead. All the police need to do now is go to where the card's been used, get the CCTV, and they have a main suspect. That lead led the police straight to Cassim Lewis. Cassim Lewis fit the profile for Juliana's murderer perfectly. All because he had been well known to the police for a string of previous offences. And these previous offences included multiple sexual offences. And let's not forget Juliana was found naked. In 2005, Kasim was jailed for two years for SA and indecent exposure on a bus, and he was placed on the offender's register, but failed to comply with restrictions. In 2011, he received a further eight month in jail for failing to comply with offender notification requirements and a community order. He'd also had a previous conviction for burglary. So yes, that does mean at the time of Juliana's murder, he was a registered offender, he was on the list and he was being monitored by police. Detectives went round to Kasim's house. That were on New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, I think it were in the early hours. Inside they found cable ties similar to those that had been used on Juliana. They also found a knife in the fridge. Most damningly, they found stained clothes and they would later prove to contain Juliana's DNA. But Kasim wasn't home. Police found him at his on and off again boyfriend's flat. And this boyfriend would tell police that Kasim used to go to Finsbury Park for encounters with other men. And even worse, on the night of Juliana's disappearance, Kasim and his boyfriend had had an argument. Kasim stormed out, leaving his wallet in his other trousers. And by the way, it's important to note here that Kasim isn't gay, he's bisexual. And the only reason that's important 
is because of what the prosecution alleges happened, or at least the motive. When Kasim was arrested on the 1st of January 2018 at his on and off again boyfriend's flat, the police read him his rights. You have the right to remain silent, anything you do say, may and will be held against you in court. And Kasim replied, what do you want me to say? I did it. And as always with 21st century police investigations, Kasim's phone was searched. And while they were looking through it, they found a few porn trailers. The trailer that's talked about most often is the one where a young woman is chased down an alleyway and then she's bound with cable ties. Not really going to go into any more detail, just because I get told off by YouTube and you don't really need to know. There was also an image found of a woman with a throat cut. Police also discovered that he'd stolen Juliana's phone. And on Christmas Day, he sent a text message to lay a false trail. It was to a contact and it said, How's everything doing today? And have you watched the news? A woman's body was found yesterday. What's going on? But it was the post-mortem that revealed the biggest insight into what happened that night. As we know, she left work, she went for a drink, she got a bus out of Camden, back to Finsbury Park at Manor House. Just after half past eight, she was seen walking towards the park, and then she's never seen again. But it's thought once she got into the park, she was rendered unconscious by being hit on the back of the head with a glass bottle. She was then taken into the burnt out hut, where she had her legs and arms bound with cable ties. At some point, Kasim had managed to extract the pin number for a bank card. Now, I have to be careful of how I say this, so it's not too graphic, but she had cuts to both her wrists that were like super deep, as deep as you can go. There were incisions and puncture wounds to her chest, and them two were super deep. There was also a horrific injury to her neck, which had been covered by denim material wrapped around her neck. She'd also had something carved in her chest. Paramedics said it looked like the Batman logo, or potentially the letter M. Ultimately, Juliana's cause of death was the stab wound to the abdomen and a head injury. There was absolutely no evidence in the postmortem of SA, but because of his track record, the prosecution did suggest that that was part of his motive and in the condition that Juliana had been found, obviously. The court was told that Kasim was under the influence of alcohol, cocaine, and cannabis when he killed Juliana. 31 year old Kasim Lewis would move to the UK as a refugee from Montserrat in 1995. At the age of just nine year old, that was following the volcanic eruption. He pled guilty to Juliana's murder at the Old Bailey on the Thursday, the 17th of May, 2018. Now, I haven't got the sentencing statement, so I can't give you the usual detailed view of the aggravating and mitigating factors. But Kasim was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 29 years. And as we know, that is a fairly decent sentence by UK standards. And a bit of information that I need to put in while I can. Juliana was that liked, that much loved, that a fundraiser for a funeral raised nearly £5,000 within just 12 hours. And at first glance, that seems to be the end of the case. No more Kasim. There were no news articles. In fact, there weren't all that much coverage of the case whatsoever. But after his sentencing, there were absolutely nothing. But then, out of nowhere, in mid-July 2019, the media started talking about Kasim Lewis once again. And that's because on the 15th of July 2019, he was taken from prison into court in regards to another murder. And once again, Kasim pled guilty, although he didn't intend to. It was on the day that the trial was supposed to start that Kasim pled guilty. And that was only because there was that much evidence he had no chance of getting away with it. This murder charge related to 55 year old Catherine Burke and she was murdered on the 16th of November 2017, five weeks before Juliana was murdered. This case weren't very widely reported at all but I did read that Kasim had been arrested for Catherine's murder later on on the same day that he was arrested for Juliana's murder and that was due to similarities between the cases. During that arrest and that interview he answered no comment to all questions that were asked. Catherine, who was originally from Galloway in Ireland, was a retired civil servant. She'd been living with her son, but he'd gone off to uni at Brighton. So she was now living alone in Muswell Hill, North London, which is about three and a half miles away from Finsbury Park. And just like Juliana's death, at the time of Catherine's death, Kasim was supposed to be being monitored by police. Catherine was described as a real character, one of the quietest you'll get. She was a really warm person, 
and she never bothered anybody. Such a lovely person. She would do anything for anyone. She would help me out in my shop whenever I needed her. She would babysit and give her last pound to help people. Kathy was a big party girl. Everyone loved her. She had a terrific sense of humour. She was really funny and really stubborn too. It was the police that had discovered Catherine's body in her own house. And that was because a concerned neighbour raised concerns. This neighbour in question was the last person to speak to Catherine. And that was on the 15th of November. So the police forced her way into her house. And Catherine was laid on a bed naked under a pile of clothes. Wearing only a pair of odd socks. She'd been bound and gagged with a Pashmere scarf. And she'd been stabbed in the neck back and stomach. It's thought that Lewis gained access to the house through the back door on the 15th of November and it's also said that DNA matching Catherine's was found on the bloodstained jeans that were seized during a police investigation into Juliana's murder. A search warrant was also executed at Cassim's ex-boyfriend's house where he'd been arrested and that's where they found Catherine's phone which Cassim had obviously stolen. It's thought that when Cassim entered the back door it was about half past six. And then Catherine's phone would try to leave in the house at ten to eight, almost an hour and a half later. Cassim's phone was also used in evidence once again. And that's because shortly after, I mean like a few hours after he left Catherine's house, he made internet searches for granny sex porn. At the end of Cassim Lewis's trial, he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 40 years. He won't be eligible for parole until the 8th of July, 2059. At that point, he'll be about 73 years old. Catherine Burke's 22-year-old son said, When someone reminisces to a point in their life, the narrative usually follows a positive route. For me, my story is one of polar opposite. The 16th of November 2017 was the day my life was completely uprooted. My world came crashing down before me. In the midst of my second year at university, I received a phone call from a then neighbour to say the police and ambulance service have been outside your house for some time. I will never forget the chilling words that followed. I don't know how to tell you this, but they believe your mom has been found dead. There is simply no amount of words that can describe the sheer devastation that this has caused to me and my family. He talked about how his relationship with his mom had absolutely blossomed after that she'd finally recognised that he'd become a man. But he went on to say, The actions of this evil being has robbed that from us. It is something I will never get back. A massive hole resides in my heart for my mother and no amount of justice will mend that. I take great comfort in the fact that the man responsible for such brutality has been caught. This is the closing of a horrible chapter in my life but the opening of a new one when I can leave this nightmare behind me. And that is all I've got for you. I can't even begin to imagine the pain and sense of loss that Catherine's son must have gone through and probably is still going through. This case is outright awful. And it seems to me that there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that if Kasim hadn't been caught when he had, he would be a serial killer by now, if he ain't already. And I do think that this does very much warrant a whole life sentence. He's already got several offences for SA and stuff like that. He's on the register and he's now found to have killed two people. For them reasons. He, he should never ever be let out. If this doesn't warrant a whole life sentence... It's hard to find where the line is. And unfortunately, again, this case has no advice to be given. Nobody made any mistakes here. Or anything like that. It wasn't anyone's fault. There was nothing anybody could have done. The bottom line is, Kasim Lewis is a very evil, sick and twisted person. If you can even call him a person. My love goes out to Juliana's family and her friends. Same for Catherine's family and her friends especially for a son. I really do hope that he's gone on to get fully qualified and is making something really great for his life. All I'm saying is, I love you. Take care of yourself, take care of those around you, and I'll see you next week. Bye.